All right. So in this session, I want to speak on uh, what uh, 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 Pastor Shadat thought powerful stuff. And I, I just want to touch on some, some, well, I'll call it your own personal revival in this session. Now, we've said that a revival can be reawakening. I'm going somewhere with this. And also restoration as new life and power is injected into you as an individual. Now, if you put up the two graphs yesterday, help me put it up. I want to use it to explain something. All right, two graphs there. Can you put up the graphs, please? All right. So he said, just let's take this as your personal life. You start out, there is growth, there is a development that is going on, and life is in phases. You get to a particular phase within your life, and you have arrived at the place of maturity at that phase. Now, what begins to happen is, it is either you start a new phase, or you begin to go into what we said here, decline. And it's natural. Which means once you start out, there is growth. You get to a particular phase in what you are doing. And it's now time to move into another level of glory or into another phase. Now, if you don't move into that other phase, then what is going to set in is going to be a decline. Now, the second graph tells us that at that particular point there, put a second one, in maturity there, the decline starts, and then there can be a renewal. Well, you don't have to experience the decline, but there can be a renewal, and if that renewal is not done, which is what we call a revival, then what happens is death sets in. So we've said, when you talk about powerful ministries in the past, uh, powerful churches in the past, powerful ministers in the past that are no longer on, a, on the cutting edge, you grow to a point where you arrive at a place of maturity and success in a particular phase, and then it's time to go to the next phase, and you don't respond to the nudgings of the Spirit, and then a decline begins to happen. Now, once it is time for a renewal or a revival, what God will do is that he will give you the signs, because timing is everything. The Bible says that to everything, there is a time. Every purpose has timing. Everything has a season. Scripture we're going to look at this says, Ask for the Lord for rain in a time of what? Latter rain. In other words, if your prayer is going to produce results, it has to coincide with the timing of what God intends to do. Very important. In the realm of the spirit, timing is everything. Which means a person must know the times and the seasons. So you are in alignment with the times and you are in alignment with the seasons. Now what God is going to do once you get to the point where a revival is needed, he will give you the signals. And I want to talk about some signals that he gives. Once he begins to give the signals, if you don't respond to the signals for a renewing, which means he says, I cannot pour old new wine into old wine skins. I want the wine skin to change. In other words, I want you to be transformed so that I'm able to pour out this new wine into it, so you have a new expression. So he begins to call you into that. 
and he will show the times to you on the outside. And I won't show you scripture what I mean by time. Now, if you don't respond to those times, the signals is given, then a decline will begin to come. In other words, if you are in a ministry, and I heard Pastor DeBray say this, he said, if there are 100,000 people in a place, and there are 90,000 people in the place, it's only the person standing on the pulpit that will know. People, other people will not know. You will see that there are places where people used to sit, that they are no longer sitting. Once that decline comes, it's because you didn't get the signal. If you got the signal, you will switch without people on the ground knowing. Are you, you understand what I'm saying? And that's what leadership is. In other words, the leader stands on the watchtower, detects something long before any other person detects, makes the switch before anybody begins to experience the decline. In other words, if we did not start planting churches, this church will have started diminishing. Do you get what I'm saying here? Now, the bad thing is you can double what you are doing to have gotten the church to that point, but it's not what is required. Do you, you understand what I'm saying? You get it? Because if you are doing what you are doing in the last phase, over and over and over again, and you amplify it, in fact, you will increase the rate of death. I've used this very simple thing to explain it. When a child is born, the child cries. The parents are happy. I know you should say, everybody's happy, the child is crying, the child is alive. The child begins to dominate everything in the environment with crying. You are hungry, you cry, the parent, everybody. So, at a particular point, the child feels, I've mastered the environment. If only if the president comes to that house and the child starts crying, the president will turn to the child. So I can move presidents this way. Until one day that season is over and the signals start coming. Stop crying. Stop doing this. If you now say it was crying that got me the thing in the first place, I will double up the crying, which was the child does, and increase the crying, you increase the rejection. Do you get what I'm saying here? So if you double what you are doing the last time, what you're going to do is that the season has what? Changed. So first of all, let us look at what are the signals that God gives. And these signals are external signals. God is not far. He said, you see the clouds, you know the rain is coming. He said, the south wind blows, you know that heat is coming. How is it that you don't discern the signals? Luke chapter 21, verse 29. Now, let's see. Let me just say this here. Put the graph back up. This is what, this is what I want you to understand. Put that graph back up. You see this? When you start here and you start growing, you are doing the first works, your first love. That's why you started growing. Hmm? You are reading the Bible for reading the Bible's sake. You are praying and praying and you are fasting and all that. By the time you get to maturity, this is how it happens to us naturally. We get distracted into other things because now we have the wherewithal. When you are going to have a renewal, you have to go back to the initial practice of what you are doing. Do you get what I'm saying here? You have to start reading the Bible for reading the Bible's sake, not for preaching. You have to go back to prayer for fellowship, not to grow your church. So in Luke chapter 21 here, verse 29. And he spake unto them a parable, behold, the fig tree and all the other tree, and all the trees. Next verse. He says, when, now, when, when, they, when they now shoot forth, you see and know your own selves. That means you know by your own, you know, nobody needs to tell you, you know that the summer is nigh and at hand. Next verse. 
So likewise, when you see these things come to pass, you know that the kingdom is near. Luke 12, 55 and 56. Luke 12. When you see the south wind blow, you say there will be heat. And it comes to pass. In other words, it's about timing. If the south wind hasn't blown and you say there will be heat, you are not reading the times correctly. Ye hypocrites, you can discern. Now Jesus said, I mean, you can look at the face of the sky and discern it. How is it that you can't discern the times? In other words, God too is showing in the times that there is something that is going happening here. Now, just talk about two things that God uses. Number one, once you get to that point, there is going to be stagnancy. In other words, you are going to start experiencing dryness because there will no longer be a move of the Spirit as we know in Deuteronomy chapter 2 verse 3 he says you have gone around this mountain enough. So you have been going around, you've come past this mountain, you have been going around the same thing and he says it is now long enough, turn you northward. Now listen what is very important is this if you don't know how to birth a revival or a renewal, once you're going around, and this is where the, let me say, I mean, people go into motivation speaking. Once you're going around and going around, if you don't know how to move up in the spirit, you will take another option. You can be a pastor and you'll go into politics. Because you have gone around and around, I'm sorry, you've gone around and around. You cannot be a pastor and say, listen to me. In fact, you will say you are not even doing ministry again, that you are now called into business. Uh, are you following me? You'll be going around and around and say, because you, you, know, you don't know how to move to the next level. And moving to the next level, you need to humble yourself back to the first principles. You know, listen, this is our presence and prophetic. Somebody told me to work for him in ministry in this city. So I went to after school, I went to work for him. So he said I should go and study a church and he took me, I've said this before, to a place in Victoria Island. It was owned by a lawyer, a prominent lawyer. And it, the building was white and all of that. So in preparation to go and work for him, I went to Benin City to listen to that bishop in a minister's conference. And that bishop was preaching. I mean, thousands of people were there. He just got up, he said, some of you, young man, you're a young man, you're in Lagos. They took you to a white building in Victoria Island to go and start a church, a branch of their church. That is where you're going to die. <laughs> now, yeah, of course, he didn't know. I didn't know. He, he didn't know me. He just said it. For all intents and purposes. In fact, what happened was, when the matter got to, I'm leaving, and Bishop Rilego called us. I said, he said, so why are you leaving? I told him. He said, there's grace on you. You waited after you heard this if it were me, as we finish here in Benin, I will have gone to where I'm going. You are still explaining. After this kind of prophetic word came. But the man told me, this is what he said to me, God has called me to Lagos. He said, but I can't do ministry like a beginner again. I cannot be fasting. I cannot be praying. I cannot be calling people from the north, south, east. He said, I'm beyond that. It's around the same time Bishop Oedipo came to Lagos. And he went to Ikpaja. Yeah, Ikpaja. See, the man fasted until he coughed blood. He went back to the principles. Because when God wants to take you from level 5 to level 10, he will take you from level 5 to level 3. Then from 3 to 10. Do you understand what I'm saying? When he says a camel cannot, has to go through the eye of the needle to enter the kingdom of God, the eye of the needle is not needle and eye. It was a small hole in the gate. It's like, say, you have a main gate, then you have pedestrian gate. 
So they had the gates for the camel, but the camel will have to bow down. And you have to remove all the, like, the goats by itself. He says, so you will have to bow down low. And people don't want to do that. Because you have to expose yourself is almost like a risk you are taking again. And you can look like a failure after you are a success. Uh, you get what I'm saying? So stagnancy begins, and sometimes people just take the option. They don't take the option of, uh, like what we said, Charles Finney said, the means through which revival will come. The laid down procedure and the method for it. The second one is this, and this happens to people, and please hear this well, is that God will use people who have entered into the next phase to provoke you to jealousy. And when we will now start getting, it's a method that God uses. Romans chapter 11 and verse 11, and sometimes he will take one person and push the person out and then... Look, it says, I say then, have they stumbled that they shall fall? God forbid. But rather, through their fall, salvation is come unto the Gentiles, for to do what? Provoke them to jealousy. That is, once you start getting to a place where you hear of other people, maybe your contemporaries and all of that, they are progress, and you are now catching something on the inside. God is saying, I'm, I, want, I will show this here, I'm calling you to something. What happens is that jealousy, people turn it into anger and attack like Cain. So you find out that the firstborn that went forward, the people that were now, it was, I mean, I think Pastor, um, Pastor Ben Saltopil has said it here, that he can tell you the years in which the doors were opened in the spirit realm. And that all major ministries, they, they entered into it at a specific time. Which means a door was opened. Now, so God opens a door. And there must be a firstborn. Somebody goes first. It is either you understand that there's a moving in the spirit. And there's something you have to do. Or you get angry at that person. And people start attacking. Now, please, I'm going to say something. That somebody else's work provoked you. That's why the Bible says, let us provoke one another. There is, there is divine provocation. It's in the Bible. Do you get what I'm saying? If you are not being provoked by anybody, you won't, make, you won't, you won't, you won't, you won't go anywhere. It says, let us provoke one another unto what? Good works. But that you are provoked... See, covetousness is when you now want to have what that person has. I'll show this. What God is telling you is, through this person I'm saying, you are missing something in your own life. I'm going to show this here. Hebrews 10 verse 24 says, it says, consider and provoke all right, one another. Now, Cain was provoked, but he read it wrongly and attacked Abel. And once you see people start attacking, you know, a colleague, a ministry, once you see that people now, it's almost like they gang up, they, God opened the door for them. Do you get what I'm saying here? It is the season of all those people that are operating in envy and jealousy. They are just reading it wrongly. So what has happened is that they become kings that want to kill the Abel instead of saying that if you do well, that there is something, it's an invitation. God is saying something, that there is something you also. That's what leads us to James chapter 4. All right? James 4, 1. From whence come all the wars and fighting? Among you, come they not hence from your loss that won your members. It says, You lost and have not, you kill. 
In other words, you start attacking and desire to have and cannot obtain your fight and war and have not because you do what? Ask not. It's a call to prayer. Are you following what I'm saying? Now, I'm saying this where you don't read it. All right? The signals came, you didn't read it. God now says, all right, this is the final thing. Somebody else in the environment read it, entered into it. Peter gets out of the boat and starts walking on water. You are still in the boat. Shouldn't you say, bid me to come? Instead of saying to Jesus, bid me to come, you take the stone and you're throwing it at Peter, that you come back. Are you following what I'm saying? Here? I will tell you the truth. I asked Bishop Edeko once, I said this before. I said, how come you are at this stage in life and many of your colleagues got offended? And with that, he said, but you answered the question. They got offended. What I did not see was they got offended in you. Jesus said, blessed are those that are not offended in me. The success of somebody can cause offense, and a man's enemies are those of his house, especially those of his household. You can't get offended in the success of a stranger. You get offended in the success of somebody in your nucleus. So I'm telling you, if somebody in your nucleus has gone to another level, it's an invitation that the door has been opened. But you are not going to get there without doing what they did. For God told Cain, if you do well, it's not by association. You have to pay your own price. Are you following what I'm saying? So the real issue is that you are missing something. Now, many people, what they do is that, ah, well, I won't be able I'll just go and copy what that person is doing. That's not what God is calling you to do. Let me repeat. Copying is not what God is calling you. If you go and copy, you may look like you're getting the same results, but you just find out. Listen, let me tell you what will happen. Let me tell you what will happen. You, you, okay, let's say now, Pastor, Shola is operating the prophetic. You two say, you, but God didn't call you. You two now say you are operating the prophetic. You just find out that when there is a prophetic conference, they will never invite you. <laughs> so your anger will be amplified again. That after I've done what he is doing, one thing about the army in Joel 2, the Bible says they shall all keep their ranks. Second thing, they will never thrust the other on the side, which means they shall all run like a mighty man. They shall climb the wall. They shall march everyone on his own ways. They shall not do what? Break their ranks. Let me put it like they shall not, neither shall one thrust another. So everybody is following his way and nobody is attacking you understand this? Because everybody understands they are ranking in the spirit world. So somebody can be called into the prophetic. Somebody can be called as an evangelist. But it was the prophetic person that provoked this person to go and seek the Lord. Without provocation, you won't go anywhere. That's even what is called hardness of heart. Romans chapter 11, verse 11, look at it again. He says, I will show where the problem came from. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid, but rather through their fall, salvation has come to Gentiles to provoke them to jealousy. Now, what was the original problem? Romans chapter 11, 6, the context in which he was writing that. Look at what he said. He said, and if it be by grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace, but if it be of works, then it's no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. 
Now you want to enter into grace. Look at verse 7. What then? Israel had not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election had obtained it, and the rest were what? Blinded. So it is people that are blinded, which means the person who entered their own, their eyes were opened. Do you get what I'm saying? To something, and as they entered into it, grace followed them. It is not in that blind state to copy that person, but to ask for your own eyes to be what? Opened. That means this person's eyes has been opened, all right, to something else. I'm comfortable. I heard Pastor Hal literally say he is not into opening campuses. Do you understand what I'm saying? He's my friend. That is his calling. He is not criticizing me. He's saying his own. And me too, I will say my own. That what God is doing, as far as I'm concerned, is this. What God is doing for him too is what? That. And I will learn principles that is operating in his on how to do... Do you get what I'm saying? In fact, from what he has said, I've understood something better. That before you open a campus, this is what you should do. Not that he's saying don't open campus. He's saying open campus, but do this. But somebody who is blinded will say, can you imagine he's attacking me? Do you get what I'm saying? Are you following? So what you need now is that, and that's the prayer. Because if you are blind, you are blind. I mean, we'll see it in the book of, of uh, Revelation, one of the churches. He said, you are blind. You have money, you have everything, but you are blind. He said, you are naked, you are blind. So you can have things on the outside. You have a lot of money. People, I mean, I mean, there are churches that no, you we all know old that don't longer have life, but they have cash. The richest churches in the world are not prophetic again, but they have built a system of getting money. One time I went to England when I was young. My father he showed me. He said he said he said ah, church in England they don't they don't raise offering. Which offering? He said he told me he said you see this street here. This property belongs to Church of England. This property is provided. from the rent. Any pastor can be preaching nonsense. The rent that is on ground, the church will be financed. You can come there and say vanity is vanity. All is vanity. Cash, not from people. Cash, and this is serious money. That's except Jesus comes, that money can't be affected. An earthquake has to destroy the buildings for there to be an earthquake. That is, you know, you say, ah, God is judging somebody, they don't have money again. They, listen, their money, it, it, judgment doesn't touch that money. It's something else that God uses to show them you are in error. Do you understand something? So it says, Romans 11, it says that, the, all right, so we see this verse 7, uh, verse 8, it says, the rest were what? Blinded. So it's that God should open up my eyes, Romans uh, 11, 8, uh, according as it is, God has given them a spirit of slumber, eyes that should not see, and ears that should not what? Hear. And that's why they are now jealous and attacking. And what they should have done is, and that's why even get what James was saying, he was saying the reason why you pray is to consume it on your lust. In other words, you are asking for what somebody else has. You are not asking for what God has apportioned to you. The workers in church, you know, the scripture that Bishop Waleoke shared today about persecution, about Nigerians going around, is the exact thing God gave me. I've never discussed it. He said, look, my friend, this financial persecution and spread is for you to be spreading church everywhere. Follow your members. Wherever there are clusters, go there. So you don't have to tell me. Someone say, Pastor, Pastor, you have to come to Cyprus. There's no cluster there. I'm not going. I don't need to hear heaven. All right? People have told me, America, we come to America. Come, why are you not coming to America? What's wrong with you? There's no cluster there. 
you will go there. All the people that promised you, they will be in church. When you get there, only you will be in the service. Where are you? Well, I'm so busy, I can't come. I say, then you will know that. When God doesn't send you, don't let men invite you. So quick, I want to show something. So there is an area that you are graced. And that's why he said they are blinded. All right? The Bible says that it's called election of grace, which means yeah, Paul said, look, I am graced for the Gentiles. Uh, uh, Peter is graced for the Jews. In other words, somebody else is graced in this area. Open my eyes and ears so I know where grace is flowing for me. So the provocation is not to copy another person what another person is doing, but to seek the Lord. And that's why that time comes that you now begin to seek the Lord. That something, all right, is happening in this area. It means that a door has been opened. Jeremiah chapter 8 and verse 7. You should have quoted the scripture Jeremiah chapter 8, verse 7, and God said, he says, Yea, the stock in heaven knoweth her appointed times, and the turtle and the crane and the swallow observe the time of their coming, but my people know not the word judgment of God. Now, if you look at Ecclesiastes chapter 8 and verse 6, what does it mean by judgment? It's talking about timing. Ecclesiastes says, Because to every purpose there is time and what? Judgment. Therefore, the mystery of man is great upon him. In other words, once you are out of timing, forget about all the activities and blah, 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 blah. there'll be sorrow in your heart. You will no longer be excited, all right, and sorrow. And that state of being sorrowful doesn't mean you should just make a decision in haste. Uh, we, we've missed this. Uh, what did what Jesus say? He said, You will see me then in a little while, you will not see me again. He said, you will have sorrow, but it's like a woman in travail had sorrow. He says, but when you have to go and do what is called spiritual birthing of that thing, it's not just an intellectual decision. You have to birth that thing in the spirit. And when you birth, and the only way you can do it, all right, is soul travail and intercessory prayer. That means you give yourself into a season of that type of praying. And what is going to happen is that after some time, your eyes will see and your ears will hear. That this is what God has for you. You step into it and grace is just released. Multiplication starts. It is that soul travail and intercessory prayer. And look, I'm telling you, this person, when I, when I went, when I... Uh, that I said I can't come and be calling people n left, right, north, center. I can't be calling people. All right? S one day I was talking to somebody, um, a, I'm called the person, say, a major minister in this country. He said, so where is this person now? Because he trained him in ministry. And when he trained him in ministry, let me say, I won't call the person so that he were, when he trained him in ministry, he was part of the first graduating class in their Bible school. There is somebody in ministry today, if I call his name, if I call his name, he was in that class. He ordained him as an administrative staff. He ordained this person I'm talking about as the only and first minister in that ministry that he says has the capacity to leave the ministry and go and start a work. This person I'm saying that was in that class was ordained as an, if I call the person's name, that's in terms of spirituality, is a terrible thing to me so. So, this one asked me once, said, where is this person? You know him now? I said, yes. I said, he's here. He said, ah, I've been to that city severally. Nobody has ever mentioned his name to me that he's in that place. Do you understand the depth of that? For somebody to come to a town and to say that I've not met anybody on the road, that, which means that that presence... So, please, those of you that are called into ministry that you have calling. If you're not going to ministry, this one has nothing to do with you. All right? Lester Summer told Pastor Baker, I heard from somebody before he died. 
He says, as a minister, this is the rule. Others may, but you can't. See, if you are called into ministry, before you japa, go on your knees. Is this thy will, O Lord? Because that move can be the last thing you will do. If God didn't send you, it is the last I'm telling you. If you are not called, though, it's business. Yeah, ah, just weigh the thing. <laughs> All right? And if it's not so, you come back. I mean, wait. All right? But if you have a calling, all right, it means that God has put his hand on you and he has an investment in you and it means people's lives are tied to you and it means that if you leave the country, some people will not enter into the will of God for their lives because they are called to you and therefore you'll be responsible for the lives of those people. It's not a decision you just make. Are you following what I'm saying? In other words, a minister when you stand in heaven, God will point to this person. They miss their path because you didn't do what you had to do. They miss this path. In other words, God looks at his body and says, I've called 268 people in this city and maps out people in the city to those 268 people. If one of those 268 people goes out of place, it may take God years and decades to reorganize these people back in. It's not just something you do. If you have a sense of guilt as a minister, it is good. Because there are no guilt in Christ. You must feel guilty if you are called. That's my purpose, to put that burden on you. Are you following me? Jeremiah 8 from 5 to 8. Let's just look at it. Jeremiah, I'm going to comment, verse 7. Why then is this people of, of Jerusalem sl sliding back by a perpetual backsliding? They hold fast deceit. They refuse to return. Verse 6. He says, I hearken and heard, but they spoke not aright. No man repented him of his wickedness. What have I done? Everyone turned to his cause as the horse rusheth into battle. He now said, Yea, the stock of heaven knoweth are appointed times. The turtle and crane and the swallow observe the time of their coming, but my people, in other words, that's where the backsliding now begins. So I just want to show something here, what you need to do. All right? So there's provocation that comes in. Okay, timing is everything in the spirit. Luke chapter 1, verse 10. Timing is everything in the spirit. Timing is everything. The whole multitude of people were praying without at the time of incense. So they understood that, listen, they went in, there was time of incense there, and everybody, that was when Zechariah went in, and everybody knew that the time of incense to them was when the incense was taking up prayer requests to heaven. Everybody was, so they understood timing, okay? Ze Zechariah chapter 10, verse 1. It says, ask the Lord for rain in the time which means your prayer must coincide with the time. The time of the latter rain, and the Lord shall make bright clouds and give them showers of rain to every one grass in his field. To every one. You can't take another person's rain to cause grass in your own field. To every what? One grass in their field. The root cause, however, which means once it's time for this, what is the root cause? What, what actually, all right? Now, we've said this, that. We've said this, that. There will be, God provokes you to jealousy. But, all right? And that's because there is something he wants you to see that you haven't seen. And so, somebody else who sees theirs, then God says, at least this, this should make this person know that something is going on. Now, God is doing that. Because you, you started it. He didn't start it. I will explain what I'm saying. Deuteronomy chapter 32 and verse 21, 
It says that they have moved me to jealousy. This is what God said. Though. They are the ones who started this jealousy thing. They moved me to jealousy with that which is not God. They have provoked me to anger with their vanities. I will move them to jealousy too. Do you get what I'm saying here? Move them to jealousy with those which are not a people. I will provoke them to anger with a what? Foolish nation. So the reason why you are being provoked to that jealousy is because you, your own self, you are no longer hanging around with God as you ought to. Do you get what I'm saying? I think among us, says, no, you are not hanging around with me like you are supposed to. That's why this is getting to you. And you know, God, I mean, the prophetic means you see. So what happens is, and if you don't see, you don't see. Do you get what I'm saying here? Prophetic means you see. In other words, you just saw something. Look, there is reading the Bible, there is seeing into the realm of the Spirit. You can read the Bible and know the scriptures, but you, can't, you haven't seen. Remember there were two men that Jesus met, that Jesus was sharing the scriptures to. And they were with Jesus. And Jesus asked them, why are you men sorrowful? They said, are you a stranger in this town? They were telling Jesus this. Have you not heard about Jesus? They were telling Jesus that he's a stranger in town. That like, don't you heard about Jesus? He said, yes. He said, this Jesus was crucified. They didn't know they were with him. And Jesus was sharing and sharing. And after some time, their eyes were opened and they saw that it was him. And they said, didn't our hearts burn within us when he shared the word? So you can have burning experience from, from the word of God. But yet you are not saying into the spiritual. What, what does that mean? That means you know with all fullness that God shall supply all of my need according to his riches in glory. And you are in the wine feast. And you know that. And you are confessing it. But the pots that are there, you haven't seen that we are to put water into the pots. So it is seeing something, which is seeing an opportunity, seeing the area, and say, look, this is what we are going to go into. All right? And the only person that will see is therefore the person that has satisfied the demands of God that you have not provoked me to jealousy through idolatry. That means, I will say this, this person is a worshiper of God. And the blessing of the worshiper is eyes that see and ears that hear. So, one of the things he's calling you into back is worship. In other words, spending a time with God in worship. Spending time before the Father worshiping. This is how you are rebuilding because it's the altars there, the incense, and that's worship. You are going back to that place of worship. Romans 10 and verse 19 all right, and the same thing says in Romans, he quoted Deuteronomy chapter 32. But I say, did not Israel know? First Moses said, I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people, by a foolish nation. But they were the ones who provoked the Lord first, all right, to jealousy there. So it says, return back to your first love. This is what I have against. Go back, all right, so you get to that top there. It says, go back to your first love. All right, you just go back to your first love. In Revelation chapter 2 and verse 4, it says, go back, all right, to your first love there. Nevertheless, I have somewhat because you have left, right, your first love. And when, when, you, when you leave your first love, you, you now have what is called other lovers in life. Now, these other lovers can even be brethren. You like spending time gisting with Christian folks about Christian issues than worshiping Jesus. When you got saved, you were alone. You had that solitary time you spent with God. Now you are popular. And you are now enjoying. All right? Being. And God has removed some of those people from your life. It could be the work of ministry. Uh, you don't know. I mean, when I got saved, I had the friend, and she would go from this convention to. I told her one day, I said, Listen, listen, 
The way you used to go to parties is the way you're going for this convention. You are, you are not seeking. It's like you, you are a happening person. So nothing must be happening in the body of Christ and you are not there. It's not that God instructed you to go there. It's that you don't want to say that there was a convention, like there was a party and I wasn't there. You are now, this thing is that same attitude here that you are using in this particular thing. You may even be more in love with the anointing God gave you than with God himself. Which means that, you know, if you, if you are anointed and you preach, see, see, let me tell you this. I broke my toes once. I, I kicked something, so I split my two toes. And so they told me that I should, I mean, I tied the toes together. And I was told not to wear covered shoes. And, I, and this, I mean, it was going to last for maybe six weeks or eight weeks. I said, how will I go to church? Wearing a slipper. So it's not possible. So I didn't wear that. But when it's time for church, I wear my shoe. Hmm? But you know, once you stand to preach and the anointing comes on you, all the feeling will disappear until you finish preaching. You know, that's how it works. Aha. Uh -huh. You know, so when you are preaching and an anointing is there, there you, there's something, there's an experience you have. You can love that experience more than Jesus. You can even love the greetings of people more than the person who gave you the thing. So we're not saying that you went worldly. We are saying that you even shifted into Christian activity. Let me tell you this. It's just that sometimes, you know, you want people to serve and inspire. Why we started this church? What, what are you saying? <laughs> You'll be here. You'll say you are doing car park. You won't come in to listen to the word. Something like that, too. I will pass on and call you. Come, 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 come and sit down inside here. That you say that you are serving in a ministry and you, I don't see you in prayer meeting. I used to tell them, I said, some, ah, somebody came with his, they, they, well, they didn't get married but, but at that time. I went, George, he said, your pastor is driving us away from what we used to do once you come into church. I said, I'm not accepting it. Because I told them, I said, listen, if you are doing all of these activities and you become visible, you become all of that, content-wise, you are empty. Satan comes to attack you. Something happens. Now, people will look at you as a strong Christian. They don't understand that. Do you get what I'm saying here? I didn't have a release until I read inside somewhere that people cannot grow spiritually without service. I said, okay. Now check your own life. I now checked well. That when I got to say, ah, okay, but how do we balance this thing? Where you are not, as Mary and Martha, you are running around, but the most essential thing, you are not doing it. So finally, in closing here, so what do you, I just want to touch on, on the element here of worship and then the last session, they'll talk about soul travel and intercessory prayer. Break up the fallow ground, the scripture says, and seek the Lord until he rains righteousness upon you. Now, how do you break up this fallow ground? And I'll show this. is thanksgiving, it's worship unto God. That's how you begin to break up the fallow ground, all right, and break it up. All right, while you're waiting there in prayer. So you're breaking the fallow ground in worship and you are seeking the Lord in prayer. You are breaking the fallow ground in worship and thanksgiving and you are seeking the Lord there in prayer. All right, so to yourselves, I say, break up your fallow. So I say, you are breaking it up. So it's a combination there of, of deep worship and then you're saying here that you are praying. So thanksgiving and worship, returning to the Lord beginning to worship him. I mean, go back. Uh, show this here. Uh, that's what happened to, to Nebuchadnezzar. He said, look, your storm will, of your kingdom will be left in the ground. He says, until you know that the heavens doth rule 
and he has given the kingdom to whosoever he wills. In other words, until you know the source of everything and you come back. So the ground, everything, there was no rain and everything. says you must come back. And the scripture says that when Nebuchadnezzar says, when I now returned and started giving God glory, we said this yesterday, that the first thing is ingratitude, begin to give him thanks. Even the anointing, go and worship him that he deposited something in you. Every single thing that is going around your life, go and worship. Because you may just have slipped to the point where you think you are the one doing it. There's a thin line between, all right, knowing God as the source and thinking that it's my method, my strategy, and all these things that I've done it. Because I bet you, every strategy you use that produces growth, somebody else has used it and didn't produce growth. Somebody told me, he said, you went on television. That's why your ministry, I said, should I tell you, on the day I went on television, the other people that went on television that same week. I said one of them is still in the same place that they are from the first day of television. Another's ministry has folded up, who used to be just before me. Another in the afternoon that was there, and we don't even know where he is again. So you can go and do exactly what other people are doing. It's the blessing of God on something that makes it prosper. And so when you go back, you might have felt, well, I got this strategy. And then as you are thanking him, God shows you many people that use the same strategy. Ah, and then you say, Lord, it's your mercy. In other words, you can plant, Apollos can water, but God independently must give the increase. In other words, you have to do something, but if you don't recognize that it's God that gives the increase, but he still demands of you that you plant and water, but he is the one that gives the increase. So you go back. And that's why you struggle and struggle and struggle and nothing happens so that when you break through, you will know that it's not your own effort. So go back to the first love and begin to worship and give him thanks. Return it to the personal disciplines that you had in the beginning of reading the Bible, you can never outgrow the basics. You can't get deeper than the basics. The late Kobe Bryant, they asked him, he will go there. And somebody said, he told them, he said, listen, I was, he was the best basketballer in the world at that time. And he said he was going to see him. He said, well, come and see me at 5 a.m. All right, 4 a.m. When, when I start my training. This guy said he got there at 3 a.m. And that he was already there training. And he said, ah, this guy, train, train. He said, but the interesting thing was he did not make any sophisticated moves. He was doing the same basic things over and over, the same basic things. And he told him after, he said, you are the greatest prayer in the world. You are doing the same basic things. Why don't you? He said, he said, how come you're better? He said, the problem with people is that they get bored of the basics. They get tired of the basics. And I'm trying to say that we know we are more complex. It says stay. So when it says return to your first love, go back to the basics. When you used to wake up to pray. Are you following what I'm saying? When you open up the Bible to read the word and to study the word for the sake of being ministered to. Not preparing a message to go and preach. If you cannot handle it mentally, then deliver yourself by saying that you, for the next six weeks you won't preach, you won't do anything. Do you get what I'm saying? So that you can return back to just reading the Bible so you're not preparing a sermon, you just want to read. Because let me tell you this. The most powerful sermons are not the things. You hear what I'm saying? That you go and sit down and are trying to get a message. They will come as a result of you praying over a service or a meeting. And as you are praying over it, by what is called tongues and interpretation, which you may not know, God reminds you of something he has already shown you. Yes, 
I said this before. I went to preach uh, for PFN in Ogun State, and I sat down. I sat down there, I prepared. I, but I knew that this message, that the title they gave me, uh, that I thought I saw, it didn't work with the kind of crowd because it was a very diverse crowd. I said, "This one is leadership. It's, <laughs> these people won't understand all these things." So I sat down, and I just sat down. And somebody was preaching. At the end, the person, uh, the, the bishop there beside me, just said, "Who was? Just, he just said, ah, this man didn't speak to the theme. See, we invited him. He didn't speak to the theme." So I looked at the banner. Wait, what theme did this guy? That's when I knew what the theme was. And he had just told me that. This man we called didn't speak to the theme. And they were calling me in five minutes. I opened my notes and wrote the message while I was seated there. You can only do that if you have fellowship with God. Are you following me? So, of course, you don't want to have things and be blind. You don't want to be married and be blind. Do you get what I'm saying? So, at that point, the only player point you need is that I might do what? See. After you have seen, you can now do other things. But that phase, that is the time of the word lottery. That's the season of response. So what do you do here to, 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 to spend time worshiping God? Now, again, it's about you spend time there just worshiping. Break up the fallow grounds. All the things that have happened in your life that you know you haven't gone back to give God glory, you haven't gone back to give Him thanks. All right, and you, we can in Scripture tell you that when your life goes into and starts deteriorating, the reason is lack of thanksgiving, praise, and worship. For he says, when they did not give him thanks nor glory, he gave them up. So there was deterioration in their behavior, but the real cardinal thing was that they didn't give him glory for the things that he had done and shown them. So go back. Break up your fallow ground. If you might be saying all the, if your some of the people are even angry at their parents and have not shown God gratitude because of something their parents did, but they sent you to school when you didn't think about going to school. Well, if they didn't send you to school, you will not be here today. The ministry are saying, "Our ministry, ministry, ministry," you will be somewhere else. That you go to Him and break up, which means everything in my life, I go back. And I begin to break up, and what you're doing is you're giving him praise. You're worshipping him over those things, thanking him. Some people, the truth about the matter, I'm telling you this. When I was pushing mission, nothing was happening. When I, I now understood things, I would go back to campus days. I went back to the fact that me and my friend who were talking in Ibadan, just talking like this. I mean, I was telling my wife here, I said, tonight, eh? I said, you see, you, I told her, I said, you see this thing? I've been telling you this about the connection. It's a strong ministry connection. Bishop, well, okay. I couldn't do this meeting if I was not born in Ibadan. It's not by chance I was born there. Bishop, well, okay. Is it bad? From there I knew. Are you following? Pastor Louis Johnson is from there I knew. Pastor Shulade, he came to school in Baden. That's how I got in relationship. Pastor Tony, uh, uh, Apostle Tony Rappo, he, you should have saw my mother and him together. He said, but he can't refuse. You, now you know why he can't refuse me. He cannot refuse me. <laughs> he cannot. Because, listen, in 1996, and I'm going to tell you, in 1996, when Papa Paish was going, my mother sat down with me and said, hey, hey Tony Rappo, hey, student, meaning he's my student. I said, where do you know him from? He said, I have a photograph near him that I took when he graduated. He's upstairs. But I never saw the photograph until I went to see her the last time. And it just so happened, just through. He said, that photograph I told you in 1996, this is the photograph. This is 2022. So I looked at it. I said, I'm going to show him. I took the photograph of the thing. Only for me one week after to see the professor. When I saw the man, I said, ah, isn't this the man my mother was saying? I went to check the photograph. Ah! But you see, anything God has, even the primary school you went to, there's a reason why. But if you are angry you didn't go to this one, the potential there won't come out. Which means that the people God made you know, they are in strategic positions, but you have not harnessed it because you are angry. 
that I applied for this course and I didn't get that course. Listen, they, that they didn't take you, God in his sovereignty allowed it. And it's because there is somebody in that class that can open a door for you, but because you haven't shown gratitude. You are angry. I didn't score properly in jam. It was medicine I wanted. It's chemistry they gave me. Are you following me? So he says, break up all the fallow ground. I want you to see you go back to everything. See, it was when I was thanking God for campus, and me and my friend, we just decided in Bado, we now got to Lagos, and we just happened to be in a, in, a, in a room, and they were starting a fellowship right on top, and that's how I developed a relationship with the president of the fellowship when I was still an unbeliever and all of that, and, all that, and that's how I got into everything and got into ministry. So I realized that even when I was in sin, thinking about God was with me, how much more decisions that I'm making, do you get what I'm saying here? Go back. It was when I was thanking him that he reminded me. But in school, I used to do believers, um, believers, Bible believers convention. I used to do a program here. I said this one. He said, "Now take those programs." He said, "Take it now to the public." Then I took one of them and made a platform. Before I knew what happened, boom! The whole nation. Ah, this thing I was despising. He said, "Take the other one now." I took believers comment. Boom! Wave back. The others have not taken. Are coming back. <laughs> Do you get what I'm saying? So let me just close here. Zechariah 10 1 here. It says, now I'll just say this here to show you what it is. It says, Zechariah 10 1, Zechariah 10 1, as the Lord rain in a time of latter rain, so shall the Lord make bright clouds and give them showers of rain to everyone what? Grass in his field. However, it's conditioned on something, and it's still the same Zechariah. Zechariah 14, verse 17 to 18. He says, And it shall be that those that will not come up of all the families of the earth to Jerusalem to worship the king and the Lord of hosts, even upon them shall be no rain. And what will happen, verse 18, and if the family of Egypt go not up and come out, and they have no rain, there shall be the plague wherewith the Lord shall smite the heathen that come not up to keep the feast of the what? Tabernacles. So he talked about you going up to rain. Next time, I'll speak about another one, all right, where he says that, and when you don't come and you go to the field of your friend who came up, he said, you won't get it. So this one where you don't want to worship God, but by association, you want to collect anointing, leave that thing. Leave it. See, if something is a law, then it works so throughout everybody. By now, you should know that this association thing is conditioned on something. Because the same man of God will lay hands on 100 people only to make it. So it's not just the laying on of hands. The laying on of hands is part of it. But what made it that is those two that made it? It means in the private lives of those two, they are doing something that caused the laying of hands to work. And what they are doing is they have a personal relationship with God. You can't walk in disobedience to God and say, well, let's be friends. That's what Saul was trying to do. When he says to Samuel, let's come down together so we appear as prophets. That it looks like things are still working for me after you know you have disobeyed God. All right? So you have that private worship there. Uh, but let me say this here. When God opens your eyes, you know when Abraham sent out Hagar, gave one bottle of water, and one loaf of bread. The Bible says that the son cried out to the Lord. The Lord said, I've heard the voice of the Lord where he is. All right. And God opened the eyes of Hagar to see a well of water there. In other words, once that phase is finished, there is a well of water for the next phase. If you don't see it, you'll be holding that bread and that loaf, struggling. There is a well of what? Water there. You see this country as it is. Huh? 
As it is, oh, as, it, as hard as people are saying, there are many wells in this country. Are you following me? Yeah, see, this country, several wells. Some people's eyes are being opened, and they are seeing the well. Now, the thing about it is that if there's no farming, then we can all coast along. Do you get what I'm saying? Without necessarily seeing any well. But when farming comes, pressure is to make the covenant person excel. Are you? You understand what I'm saying? Pressure. Because if not, nobody will be provoked to look for well. But when, so God says, look, we draw. Ah, let them pray. So you say, Lord, open my eyes. That I might see the what? Well of water there. I, mean, I, said, I told them in Abuja church when I went there on Sunday. I went to preach somewhere. I went to preach somewhere. The pastor said, it was Q&A now. He said, I want to show you people something. How many of you people here want to jack up? Everybody. Even the cameraman did like this. <laughs> the person operating the mixer, I said, everybody. In other words, if their will comes to pass, by December, there will be nobody in that church. <laughs> and it's the second time I'm seeing this. Somebody has labored, prayed, fasted, brought thousands to his church, and just all of them now say, it's the second church I saw. They, somebody said, word of knowledge. How many of you want visa? See hands. <laughs> Maybe there were three people left that didn't want visa. And those ones be sure they have the visa. <laughs> That's why they don't need it because I don't know. So the whole thing can be wiped out. Is a serious thing going on. And the truth about the matter is that, if I got to me, said, it is the demographic I sent you to that wants to live. Some people, the demographic they have, don't, don't want to live. In fact, this church I went to, the pastor that told me, protocol person, he said, Are you going? Yes, my husband has gone. You, are you going? I went, so if you're not careful, it can affect your vision. So you have to see a well of water that guarantees increase. Do you get what I'm saying? Or else you become angry. When we say, I'm leaving, you're leaving too. You're leaving too. I said in church in Manchester, they said three to five people come from Lagos every week. I said, how many will be left if three to five are coming? <laughs> Do you get what I'm saying? But it's time to ask, and it can only come from what? Worship. Are you understanding? Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your word. Thank you for the sessions this afternoon. Thank you for your utterance. Thank you for the ministry of the Spirit. And I ask that these things we've learned today stay with us for the rest of our lives. An eternal seal is placed upon it. And it brings forth fruit in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you all. See you one last time, 5 p.m. for the evening session.